What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Octopath Traveler 2. The follow-up, of course, to Octopath Traveler, a well-received JRPG from a few years ago, and the second title here largely carries forward that torch while iterating on some of the key features in addition to adding some new ones. Though to get my usual stuff out of the way right at the beginning of the video, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that entails, there is a video linked in the description below that will go over it, and if you're not subscribed and go to my channel page, it's the first video that you will see. Furthermore, my Steam profile is public and linked in the description below as well, feel free to check it out. And last but not least, while this game did release a few weeks ago now, I did receive a review copy of it just before that release, but I was busy with some other stuff and it took me a while to get around to this one. From there, let's actually jump into this thing. So, first thing to know about Octopath Traveler 2 is that while it is a sequel, it is not a direct sequel. You do not really need to have played the first game to understand what is going on here. It kind of takes that Final Fantasy approach where it's a standalone title for the most part with some recurring themes, etc. But you definitely don't need to have played the first game to enjoy this one. With that said though, as the name might imply, Octopath Traveler 2 follows the stories of eight chosen heroes through their own personal tales that then all come together towards the end of the game through a connecting plot thread. And you'll go through those stories while also developing your characters, learning new abilities, taking on various jobs or classes, on top of exploring the world itself. But on that note, let's actually talk about the story setup for this title. While I don't want to spoil anything by any means, as this is still a relatively recent game, the sort of disjointed nature of the initial setup for this title also makes it a little bit difficult to describe the nature of the plot without actually spoiling something. So while I'm going to do my best to avoid that, try to keep it in mind and maybe skip this part if that's something you're worried about. Now, when you fire up the game for the first time, you will get to choose one of our eight protagonists to start the game as. While you will ultimately be able to see and do everything as well as gather up all your other party members, nonetheless, this first choice is an important one, as this character that you choose here effectively acts as a main character until you complete their story, meaning that they cannot be removed from your party until their story is complete. However, once that's done, you can swap them out as you see fit. So while you're not going to necessarily miss anything as a result of this choice, it will define a lot of your early experience. Because after you choose one of our eight characters to play as, you have to go through the first chapter of their story, which is effectively the introduction. From there, all of the other characters will still be marked on the map as to where you can find them, and once you go find them, they'll join your story at the start of chapter two for them. However, you can replay their stories, as far as chapter one goes, by going to a tavern in any city. However, after that initial chapter one, you're basically set loose on the world, and it's kind of just however you want Want to tackle it. It's as straightforward or as non-linear as you want it to be. You can go gather up all of the other characters, or start doing specific stories one at a time, etc. Each character has a five chapter story, with the recommended level for each chapter increasing as you go, and obviously each story being tailored around each individual character. However, new to Octopath Traveler 2 are the crossed path stories. Pairs of our heroes will get extra stories called crossed paths that see our companions traveling together and taking on an adventure. These are short in comparison to the full chapters for our regular heroes, but nonetheless they add a little bit of back and forth between all of our characters. Because one of my two criticisms of this particular system are that it can feel a little disconnected as you might imagine, and while they've taken some steps to make the party feel a little more cohesive as to why they're traveling together, etc., it can still feel a little bit lacking in that regard. As you move through various chapters, you can activate party banter, which can help help give your other party members a bit of a say in what is going on in the current character's chapter that you're playing through, and then the cross paths as well help in this regard. Though I would say it's certainly not perfect, especially in regards to how all of our characters meet, because basically you walk up to them, there's a very short scene, and they offer to join up with your party. And while that's certainly very simple, the game does very little in the way to justify the reasons these people are traveling together, but once you get the party together, they do a pretty good job of making it feel like a team. 
team. Though after you clear a few of these characters' personal stories, you'll probably start to see the connecting thread in each of them. But as you're going through each of their stories individually, there are plot threads that connect all of them and sort of recur through each of the stories. And once you've completed all of their stories, as well as the crossed path stories, you can unlock the sort of end game where it all comes together and sort of wraps things up nice and neat. Now, on a personal note, I would say that my favorite stories were Hikari as well as Oswald. I thought those two in particular were very, very well done. But even beyond just that, most of them are pretty good. I think there was like one that I was kind of whatever about, and that was Agnea's. But all of them are very good. Some of them go to some surprise surprisingly dark places, while others are meant to be more uplifting. And overall, I think that makes for a pretty good mix of stories. And it certainly helps as a sort of change of pace, but the quality of the writing and the stories themselves are very, very good. Now, on the flip side of that, I do think that they have a bit of a pacing problem. Some of the level gaps in between various chapters are quite high, and often I find myself needing to grind up to meet various level caps. And while this can be mitigated, through things like side quests and optional dungeon exploration, even when engaging in those things, it still felt like at certain points I just needed to grind to meet the level requirements, which got old pretty quick. And while the story itself took me about 50 hours for all eight character stories, etc., a significant portion of that was just grinding up the levels to get to where I needed to be. But nonetheless, from there, I wanted to talk a little bit about the characters as they're pretty important, honestly, and this review just didn't feel complete without mentioning them a little bit and giving you a little bit of background about what to expect. First up, we have Hikari, a prince from the Kingdom of Ku, a warmongering nation whose brutal methods cause a bit of a coup that forces Hikari to flee at the hands of his own half-brother. Then we have Particio, a merchant, setting out to be the best he can be, frankly, and make the world a better place by haggling and managing all sorts of deals, and his story involves taking on a corrupt businessman. Though he also gets a sort of extra set, if you will, of objectives called the Scent of Commerce, and completing these will unlock various benefits for you, such as getting a ship to traverse the world with, but we'll get to that. Next up, we have Throne, a sort of forced thief. She's definitely a thief, but she's part of an organization called the Black Snakes, which effectively enslaves people from childhood and forces them into a life of crime, which is deeply messed up, and that story is easily the most messed up of all of them. It goes some pretty dark places. From there, though, we have Oswald, a man wrongfully imprisoned, out to find his vengeance on the man who did this to him. Oswald is a little unique in the fact that his story, you actually have to finish chapter 1 and 2 before you're set loose on the rest of the world, and he acts as a mage. Nonetheless, though, one of my favorite stories, I thought it was really well done. Then we have Temenos, might be butchering his name, but he is an inquisitor for the Church of the Sacred Flame, and he, in short order, finds himself investigating a series of murders relating to the church, so naturally there's a lot of intrigue with this particular story, and overall I thought it was pretty well done. Being a cleric, he can either heal your party or deal some holy based damage, and despite being an inquisitor, he he has an almost sacrilegious view of his own faith. But then we have Agnea, easily the most positive of all the stories. She is a woman who is a famed dancer, and she is aiming to be a superstar after she leaves her quiet hometown. Though as you might imagine, her attempts to do so show her that her naive view of the world doesn't quite match up to reality. Nonetheless though, again, pretty positive story in comparison to the rest of them. Then we have Casti, an apothecary who recently lost her memory. She's trying to remember who she was, what happened to her, and why everyone treats the apothecary unit that she was with, Heirs Apothecaries, with quite a bit of disdain. But being an apothecary, she is also very capable of being a healer as well as dealing a little bit of damage. And then last but not least, we have Ochet, a beastling from a tribal community on an island who is on her way to becoming a proper hunter and eventually a protector of said island. However, she needs to 
gather up beasts from around the world to protect that island against a coming danger. So that is all of our characters individually, but it does get a bit more interesting than that as each of them has something unique they can offer in terms of their class and powers, as well as their path actions. Though we'll get to a breakdown of each of those things individually here in just a moment. Which brings us to our progression systems. Now, in many ways, the progression here is very classic JRPG, while also adding a few fun things into the mix. Now, the key things here in terms of progression are your level as well as your equipment, much like the rest of this genre. As we defeat enemies, take part in combat, we'll be gaining experience, which will level our characters up. Leveling up increases that character's base stats, which can be further augmented with equipment. I will say I think the game did a pretty solid job with the itemization, as especially towards the late game, rather than there being a sort of one best option, it's more so that you have options and get to choose what you want to use in each various situation. For instance, you'll have six different types of melee weapons, but within even those categories, you'll find weapons that say deal an extra attack, but deal slightly less damage, or you'll find weapons that can deal various effects to the enemy, or weapons that will raise your elemental attack versus your physical attack, etc. But they made a lot of gear that allows you to sort of specialize in one thing, as opposed to just broadly speaking equipment that is the best option which I thought was a nice touch. But the other big part of progression is the jobs and skill system. Now, each of our eight characters has a main job, the primary thing they do. Ultimately, there are eight jobs, one for each character. However, each character can have up to two jobs assigned, which is where the secondary jobs come in. In order to use these, you need to get a license for them, which involves tracking down the guild associated with that job. You'll find these as you traverse the world, but finding the guild will give you a license. A license is only good for one character, meaning that if you want more than one character to use that particular job as a secondary job, you need to complete tasks for that guild. And doing this will potentially earn you up to two more licenses for that particular job. What are the benefits of having a particular job associated with a character? Well, for starters, build diversity, as having a job equipped to the secondary slot will both give you passive increases to that character character's stats associated with that job. In addition to this, having a job equipped will give you access to that job's active skills. One of the resources you get for completing battles is job points. Job points allow you to purchase active skills for an equipped job. As you purchase a certain number of these skills, it will unlock the support skills for that job. While you have to have a job equipped to use the active skills for it, once you've earned the support skills, you can use those freely. And these can be incredibly useful. For instance, the warrior job has a skill that will increase the damage cap from 9,999 to 99,999, and all sorts of other useful things like that. Even here, there are still a couple of more unique things. For starters, we have our EX skills. These are basically special skills for each individual character and their primary job. You'll get one of these two skills by simply completing the associated character's story. The second EX skill can be found by bringing that character to a shrine that you can find out and about in the world. More interesting still is that there are four hidden jobs. Now, three of these you can find through just pretty natural gameplay. One of them you might have to look up but the hidden jobs take it a step farther. They actually have some unique progression. For instance, there's the Arms Master, which is basically just a better version of the warrior job, but in order to unlock its skills, you have to find rusty weapons and bring them to a blacksmith, and then you have to have those weapons equipped to use the skills for that job. Then there's the Inventor, which sees you having to track down various inventions, and then the other two actually just have a much increased job point requirement for each individual skill. Now, the very last skill you will learn for every single job is called its divine skill. These are just very powerful abilities that you can use only at max boost, which we'll get into shortly. But first, I want to talk about the world and the gameplay of Octopath Traveler 2. So for starters, there is a large world to explore, and you can do so pretty much freely. As I mentioned, the game can be very non-linear. You can track down various stories, do them in whatever order you please, or just explore. The stories won't take you everywhere. Some of the map and stuff is completely optional. And with that, 
comes a bunch of side quests. These will lead you to optional bosses, extra rewards, some of which even involve sort of extra bits of progression as well. For instance, Particio's Scent of Commerce side quest can lead you to owning a ship. This ship will help you navigate the sea, as opposed to having to take a ferry, and once you're able to navigate the sea, you can participate in even more optional content by finding locations only available to you if you have this ship. They've also instituted a day-night cycle, so time is passing, but the day-night cycle affects the state of the world, which NPCs are out and about, where are they, as well as your path actions. Something also unique about all eight of our characters are their two path actions, which one you can use at any given time depends on the time of day. But these actions will allow you to both interact with NPCs as well as the world in various ways. For instance, Hikari can challenge people to duels during the day or bribe people for information at night. Throne, our thief, can steal from people during the day, basically picking their pocket, or she can just flat out knock them out if she meets the level requirement at night. This can be helpful for getting past guard NPCs or finding items you need for various quests or just getting extra items, and it adds a lot of interactivity to the world. You do have to be a little careful here, and while it's hard to do, there is a little bit of consequence to messing up your path actions. In some cases, you can fail these, which will lead to a hit to your reputation, and if it falls low enough, you actually have to go pay a fine, and until you pay that fine, you actually just can't take path actions anymore, though I will say you have to be pretty determined to mess that up. Though all of those systems together really make for a world that it feels like you're actually interacting with and you're engaged with it, which is a lot of fun. If I had to offer one criticism though, a lot of the characters' path actions tend to overlap. For instance, Hikari can bribe people for information, but Casti, our apothecary, can just ask people for free. And of course, there are various requirements for each one, but my point is there's a lot of overlap here, with some just being flat out easier than others, so a little more diversity in that respect would have been nice, but nonetheless, it's a pretty good system, especially for a genre that does not typically give you a reason to interact with basically every NPC that you see. All of that, though, brings us to our combat section. Now, combat in Octopath Traveler 2 is pretty interesting. Most of it involves identifying the enemy's weaknesses and then breaking their defenses. So each enemy has a host of things that they will be weak to, various weapons as well as magic types. Hitting them with the things they are vulnerable to will of course deal more damage, but it will also eat into their shield points. Once an enemy's shield points are completely gone, they enter the broken status, which robs them of their next few turns, and makes them take even more increased damage, meaning that much of what you want to do here is hit enemies with what they are weak to, the amount of times required to break their shields, not necessarily with the intention of maximizing damage, but rather to get them into that broken state. And then once they're in that that broken state, then you want to maximize as much damage as possible, which is where the boost system comes in. Every turn, each character earns a boost point. You can use boost points to boost all of your skills, basically everything that you can do. And doing this dramatically increases the effect in some way. In terms of your base attack, it just adds more attacks. In terms of your skills, it varies depending on what the skill does, but it can either add more attacks, just make it stronger, etc. So ideally, you want to break an enemy and then max maximize your damage with things like your boost effects, as well as hitting the enemy with what they're actually vulnerable to. Though, as you might imagine, some enemies, especially bosses, have mechanics that prevent this, or make it more difficult. To add a few more systems to it, each of our characters has a latent power. These are the things that make each individual character even more unique outside of just their job. As our characters break enemies and take damage, they will fill their latent power meter. Once it's at maximum, they can activate it, and this is sort of the special ability for each individual character. In some cases, this is just a big damage move, or in other cases, it's a little more utility focused. For instance, Temenos can use his to deal shield point damage no matter what he's hitting the enemy with, or Oswald can take his AoEs and turn it into a much stronger focused single target attack. Agnia can take something that is single target and make it affect every enemy. Various little things like that. But then we have the turn order. There is a turn order, as you might imagine, which can be seen at the top of the screen. Now you'll have a decent amount of influence over this, 
including of course just your basic stats with speed affecting this, but also breaking enemies at key moments will rob them of their next turn, preventing whatever action they were about to take, alongside even more skills which can also affect the turn order. And combat really comes down to how well you can weave all of those various things together, though with this being a JRPG you can absolutely just grind levels until you are so far above your enemy that it really doesn't matter, outside of say the end game super boss. But just to throw a little tip at you, the strongest job in this game is surprisingly, in my opinion, the merchant. You see, having the merchant job on characters gives them access to the hired help merchant skill. And for an exorbitant 30,000 gold, they can use this hired help skill to hire help, or more specifically, a veteran soldier that will deal almost the max amount of damage, regardless of the level or skill of your character. And by itself, that's okay, that's just like 8 or 9k provided you're hitting an enemy that isn't protected in some way via its defenses. However, if you boost this attack, you'll hire four people at once, meaning that if you attack a broken character with this, fully boosted, you're going to deal around 40,000 damage, and most of the in-game bosses have between 80 to 160k, with a few of the more difficult ones having more. But this means that basically, through a handful of uses for this, you can trivialize basically every boss. With the downside being that this is basically unusable early game because it's too expensive, though in the late game where you can pretty easily get millions of gold, 30,000 is basically nothing. So having this job on multiple characters is sort of like an I win button if all else fails. All of that finally brings us to our Steam Deck section, and I am excited to tell you guys that this game runs flawlessly on the Steam Deck. In fact, usually I have various things to report here about small differences, little problems, but to my great surprise, the Steam Deck version of this game was almost indistinguishable from how it ran on PC. So needless to say, the game very much so justifies its Great on Deck Verified rating, which naturally comes with cloud saves as well as controller support. So you can basically just download this and have an amazing experience on Steam Deck. It is very well suited to that hardware. Again, in terms of Steam Deck performance, there's really just not much more you could ask for here. It runs perfectly. But that brings us to our positives, negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. So on the positive side of things, I think all of the stories are really well done, including how they come together at the end, with the only really weak part of all that being why our characters are traveling together to begin with, but beyond that, the stories are very, very good. On top of this, the exploration and the world were also big positives for me. Having all these ways that you can interact with the world, all these optional areas to explore, bosses to find, secrets to find, using path actions to both find different solutions to quests, as well as just discover little in-game secrets, is really, really rewarding. I enjoyed that system a great deal. Now, on the negative side of things, I really only have the two, and that is that, as I mentioned earlier, the game can certainly be grindy at times. The pacing can be a little bit off, and while that's certainly not unusual to the genre, it nonetheless can kind of get in the way of you and the good stories I just mentioned. And then the other negative is again simply that there is really no reason given for our characters traveling together, and for a game that fleshes out the rest of the story in a really good way, it offers literally no reason at all why our characters come together besides that, and while that's an easy to overlook problem, it nonetheless bothered me a little bit, but again, very minor stuff. Which brings me to my conclusion. Octopath Traveler 2 is a fantastic JRPG. In fact, I'd go so far as to say it's one of the best I've ever played. I really enjoyed the visual style, the HD 2D graphics in particular are really something to see, which I mentioned here because I didn't mention it anywhere else, but the really compelling stories, the very interactable world with all these path actions, goes a long way towards giving the player a great experience. And while the game at full price is $59.99, so full AAA price, I definitely think the game and the product you are getting justifies that pretty easily. So much so that I would say if you're a fan of this genre, Octopath Traveler 2 is pretty much a must play. It's very good. And that is where we are going to leave my review for this particular title. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.